Good morning, everybody. I'm Boris Rur, Vice President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. I've recently joined the board of the EFCE, and it is an honor for me to serve the chemical engineering community in this role. As a scientific vice president, I support our scientific groups, meaning the working parties and the sections of the EFCE, in their goals to promote chemical engineering throughout Europe and the whole world for both chemical engineers and the wider society that benefits from all the work that we chemical engineers do. I am a chemical engineer by training, and I grew up in the north of the Netherlands and studied at the University of Groningen. I joined the University of Twente in 2011, where I currently am a full professor in sustainable separation technology. Next to my academic professorship, I'm the program director of the Separations for, Sustain for Circularity cluster at the Institute for Sustainable Process Technology. This is an institute where industry and academia meet each other in order to address sustainability challenges that we as society have. Although I spent my career in academia, I have always closely collaborated with chemical industries, and it is my strong belief that it is of utmost importance that academic engineers should work together with the chemical industry on a sustainable future, where we significantly increase the degree of circularity and decrease our emissions. For me, the structure of the EFCE with both academic and industrial representatives in our working parties and sections reflects the strength of this joint undertaking excellently. We see that back today in our session, as we have speakers from both academia and industry on a highly actual and interesting topic related to machine learning and crystallization. Let me say a few words about this uh, webinar series. This is the sixth one. And um, in this sixth webinar series on Spotlight Talks, um, we present online sessions on significant topics in chemical engineering. And we started in the year 2020 during the COVID pandemic. And because of the success, we, uh, we are continuing this. Next to our meetings in person, such as the European Conference on Chemical Engineering, that will be held next year again in September in Lisbon, and the annual meetings and other conferences organized by the working parties and the sections. This series of online sessions is now a recurring opportunity for everybody interested in a wide range of chemical engineering topics. So this year, this spring sessions, we have contributions from the working parties, including from thermodynamics, membranes, education, static electricity, fluid separations, loss prevention, process intensification, chemical reaction engineering, food, and today, crystallization. During these two weeks, we have 11 sessions of three or four talks focused on specific topics, leading by, by leading industrial and academic experts. You can find back all of these talks in due time on YouTube and the links for the remaining sessions tomorrow and later in the week you can also find on the website where you found the link to register for this series, for this talk. The EFCE promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries and representing more than 100,000 engineers in Europe. The EFCE's working parties and sections cover all major aspects of chemical engineering and are at the core of our organization. Before concluding, I would like to thank all the people who worked hard inside the working parties and the sections in the EUCE in general for this initiative. And uh, today, uh, the working party on crystallization. And of course, also many thanks go to Martina Pou, uh, who did the most conceptual work and setting up um, of all these activities. I will thank you for your attention and I wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and su successful webinar. I will now give the word to Daniela Marciso from the Working Party on Crystallization to start the session. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you also uh, uh, to you and to Martin for organizing these spotlight talks, which are uh, a great opportunity for scientific exchange. Um, as mentioned, we started this during the uh, several lockdown, lockdowns of the pandemic, and we uh, keep doing them uh, because they provide us uh, with uh, a very uh, nice moment for uh, discussing and exchanging ideas. 
So uh, let me share my screen. I have prepared a very short presentation to introduce the uh, topic for today. Um, can you see the screen uh, in presentation mode? Yeah, okay. So all of you, I think, are familiar with the concept of industrial crystallization. So crystallization is a unit operation that is used to separate typically a solute or more uh, than one solute from a solvent. And this is done by uh, changing the solubility. Um, so this is done by inducing a chemical reaction, by changing the temperature. Uh, this is done by adding a solvent. Um, um, within the working party, um, we uh, cover uh, different aspects of crystallization, starting from fundamentals. So many of us are studying uh, the fundamentals of uh, nucleation, growth, aggregation, and breakage, uh, thermodynamics, uh, crystal forms, but also um, a lot of us uh, are involved in modeling, um, um, population balance modeling, computation of fluid dynamics, modeling for process control. And then some of us are also working uh, quite extensively on uh, um, chemical plant design applied to crystallization processes. So in previous editions, uh, we organized several spotlight talks. The first one was on the role of crystallization for battery uh, recycling, battery production material. Uh, the second one was done together with another working party and focused on tools that can be used in crystallization processes uh, for um, monitoring the evolution of particles and for characterizing particles. Uh, this year for the working party, uh, we decided to have a look at uh, uh, applications uh, in industrial crystallization of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Although I have to say, it's only, uh, it's mainly going to be about uh, machine learning. The approach we used uh, to put together the um, Spotlight talk uh, was to give the word to young scientists in the field uh, and to keep an eye on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, as an introduction, all of you are familiar with uh, uh, these keywords. So with artificial intelligence, we refer to uh, computer systems that uh, mimic uh, human intelligence. And within artificial intelligence, we do have several tools. Within artificial intelligence, we have machine learning, which is basically teaching systems to learn from, from data without explicit programming. And then within machine learning, we have deep learning, which is a specific type of machine learning. With machine learning, you can do many different things. There are many different algorithms that are labeled as machine learning. In these uh, talks, I think we are going to focus mainly on neural networks, but uh, we will see what uh, the speakers have reserved for us. Of course, this is a topic that is uh, becoming more and more important. If you look at the number of publications that are published every year on the topic machine learning and crystallization, the number of papers is increasing very rapidly. And uh, quite interesting, interestingly, if you look at the uh, institutions that are publishing this paper, you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the leading institutions are the Chinese Academy of Science, MIT, University of Pittsburgh, University of Toronto. And if you look at the agencies that are funding this research, uh, we can find the, the uh, National Natural Science Foundation of China, the National Science Foundation of the US, US Department of Energy, uh, of course, Horizon 2020, and also the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Uh, um, what, uh, um, what people do with machine learning and crystallization, uh, some of us are looking at uh, fundamentals. Um, so, um, People use machine learning, for example, to run molecular dynamic simulations uh, that allow them to explore time scales and land scales uh, that uh, um, uh, can be used for investigating rare events uh, such as nucleation. So one application of machine learning is in numerical simulation of relevant phenomena such as nucleation. Um, 
another uh, interesting application is again related to battery. So there are a number of phenomena that occur in batteries at the uh, electrode electrolyte interface, which are related to nucleation and growth and formation of new particles. And these have been investigated with uh, machine learning. Another interesting application, and we will hear more about it, is uh, um, looking at particles within a crystallizer and, and uh, uh, observing how these particles evolve during growth, uh, aggregation, and breakage. And then, of course, uh, machine learning can also be used to uh, rationalize uh, processes and for making decisions related to these processes, operating conditions, choice of solvents, all these things that typically uh, were done uh, by, uh, by using human intelligence can be done by uh, using artificial intelligence. So this is the program we have put together for you today. We have three presentations. Uh, the first one will be given by uh, Anna from EETH Zurich. I will introduce the, speaker, uh, the speakers one by one. The second one is going to be by Akim and the last one by Almos. Um, I want to remind all the participants that um, uh, if you want to ask questions to the speakers, um, you can use the question and answer box that you can see at the uh, bottom of, uh, of the screen. Um, and, and so now I guess I can uh, start introducing the first speaker. So the first speaker is uh, Anna uh, Yegi. Uh, she is a PhD student from ETH Zurich. She is at the fourth year of her PhD. And uh, she um, obtained previously a, a bachelor, uh, again, from ETH Zurich. And she's working in the group of uh, Marco Mazzotti. So I see that Anna is already sharing the screen. Anna, uh, you have approximately 25 minutes um, and so that we can have a few minutes for questions and answer. And the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, the talk will be about the online 3D characterization of crystals in suspension using machine learning. And first, the reason why we want to characterize the shape of crystals in the first place is that the particle size and shape distribution, which we abbreviate with PSSD sometimes, affects a powder's processability and bioavailability. And to illustrate the processability issue, I have here a video where two powders are being poured into beakers. And both powders are made up of crystals of beta-L-glutamic acid, so the same polymorph of the same compound. And we're using the same amount in terms of mass of both of them. The only difference between them is that the powder being poured in the right is made, of, is made up of equine crystals, which you can see here, while the one on the left is made up of needle-like crystals, which you can see on the right here. So when we pour the powders, you see that the first one flows very nicely into the funnel and then forms a small volume at the bottom, whereas the second one has to be shaken before it even comes out. And in the end, it forms a much larger pile than the first one, even though it's exactly the same mass. And now these effects that we have when we have unequal crystals are undesirable but they can be mitigated through crystal shape engineering or tuning the process uh, or changing the process to modify the shape of the crystals. However, to study this process, we first need to be able to accurately characterize the size and shape of crystals. Sorry. Um, now, since different compounds exhibit different distinct crystal morphologies, they also require different descriptors. Um, for example, there are many crystals which crystallize in a somewhat equine shape, for example, sodium chloride. And even though they have different morphologies and different crystal facets and stuff, they are still approximated relatively well for some applications with a sphere. And the sphere is characterized by a single dimension, namely its diameter, and that's why we also call it one-dimensional characterization. 
For needle-like crystals, you see, however, that a sphere is not such a good approximation of them anymore. And therefore, we use in our group a cylinder to approximate them. And the cylinder is defined by two different characteristic lengths, namely a length and a width, and that's why we also call it 2D. Similarly, for plate-like crystals, we use a cuboidal shape model to approximate them, which then has an independent length, width, and thickness, so three dimensions. Now, the first class of particles is relatively easy to characterize. It's the industry standard. Um, you can do it with a number of devices, for example, any that do signal projection imaging, laser diffraction, an FPRM, or a Coulter counter. Needle-like crystals are a bit trickier, but there are also devices in industry that can do that. For example, some dual or single projection imaging like morphology or blaze. For plate-like crystals, however, oops, uh, there are only two analytical devices in academia that I'm aware of that can characterize them with three characteristic lengths. And one of these devices we have developed in our group. So I will quickly introduce you to that device. Um, the device is, we call it the DISCO, and that stands for Dual Imaging System for Crystallization Observation. And the way it works is that it pumps suspension from a reactor through a flow cell, which I highlighted here. And this is what it looks like in real life. And then in the flow cell, it's being imaged by two cameras, which are perpendicular to each other. And they're both backlit by illuminators to enhance the contrast between what's a particle and what is the background. Um, this is what the device looks in real life. So it's a box of about this size. So first we acquire images in bursts, which can be collected every 30 seconds. And each burst consists of 800 images, which are taken at a frequency of 75 hertz. The reason why we do it in bursts and not um, just continuously is because then we can slow down the flow rate a bit so that the images are sharper and don't suffer from motion blur. And then when we are not taking images in between the bursts, we can speed the flow rate up again to prevent settling. Here's a video of what two cameras are seeing in sync. Um, should be playing soon. Ah, okay, it's playing. Great. So as you can see, we're imaging hundreds of crystals every burst. So we have a good statistical basis for estimating our distribution over time. Then for every pair of raw images, we first subtract the background adaptively. So if there's any dirt on the lens or something that gets canceled out, then we threshold the image to separate particles from background, extract the contours, and then match the contours from the two cameras that belong to the same particle based on their vertical position, so with respect to the flow. Once we have a pair of contours, um, we can process them further by um, extruding the two projections like this, and then intersecting the extrusions of the two projections to obtain a visual hull, which is a 3D reconstruction of the crystals. And this 3D reconstruction is not necessarily 100% accurate. It just gives you an upper bound estimate of the space where the particle could be. And its accuracy depends on the orientation of the particle. Sorry. Um, yes. Then after we have a visual hull and two contours, we use information about the particle to classify it into categories. And this is the first time here we use machine learning. So we use um, a, a classification algorithm, which takes as input 2D and 3D shape features of the contours and the visual hull to separate it into categories. And in a first step, we use a support vector machine 
to separate out spheres, so very, very spherical particles, which are usually just bubbles and we're not interested in, and non-convex particles, which are agglomerates. And these we characterize only by their volume because we don't think it makes much sense to assign a length or width or something when it's made up of multiple primary particles. The remaining particles we then input into a decision tree, which separates the particles into quasi-equant, um, which means they're characterized well enough by one length, but they're also not exactly spherical, then needle-like particles and platelets. Once we have separated our types of particles, we apply a different length estimation algorithm to each of them, and then bin all the lengths of the particles we measured into a distribution. So in the case of the quasi equal particles, we bin them into a simple particle size distribution, which you're probably all familiar with, where we just have the number density function um, as a function of the length. When we have cylindrical particles or needle-like particles, we then have two lengths. So our number density function is a function, is a surface um, as a function of two lengths. And since 3D plots are a bit annoying to read, we can simplify this a bit more by kind of slicing the surface at different levels and then looking at it from the top. And in this way, we generate a contour plot, which shows us that in the darkest area is the lengths at which most particles are. For 3D, however, we cannot really plot the number density function as a function of the three lengths directly anymore because that would require a four-dimensional plot. So we just do the equivalent of what we did here and do a three-dimensional contour plot where these ISO surfaces, so kind of this blob, contains the regions in 3D space where most of the particles lie with respect to their length. And since it's a bit hard to tell where exactly this blob now is in 3D space, we also usually plot marginal distributions, which are a bit like a projection of the 3D distribution onto all of the planes. So then you can read exactly with the grid lines where the distribution lies. And if you're interested more in the hardware and shape analysis pipeline, so the image analysis up until this point, it's published in a paper which is linked with this QR code. So I've kind of glossed over now on how exactly we get the lengths. And that's because for equal and needle-like crystals, it's a pretty simple, straightforward algorithm. But for platelets, this was a bit more challenging. And this is where the machine learning comes in and what I'll get into now. But first, um, why are platelets even so challenging? So to illustrate this, I have here the exactly same particle, just oriented differently with respect to the camera. And here in gray, you see the imaging plane of the camera and in turquoise, the projection of this particle onto the plane. So this is kind of the image that the camera would see here. If we do the same with the other particle, you see that the projection looks very different. And of course, if we try to estimate lengths based on this object we see, we will get very different lengths and only two of them, even though the real particle has three different lengths. But what if we had a second camera? So in the first case, if we got the second camera image, and intersected the extruded projections to get this green visual hull now, you see that it's a fairly accurate representation of the original particle. And if we try to estimate lengths based on this 3D reconstruction, they would also be not perfect, but close, close to the original. In the second case, however, when we intersect these two contours, we get something that looks nothing like the original particle, um, the volume is way bigger, and when we try to estimate some lengths based on the green object we reconstructed, the thickness is also overestimated multiple times. So to conclude, with single projection imaging, at best, you could get two lengths out, and with two projections, at best, three lengths. However, 
for both single and dual projection, the accuracy of these lengths heavily depends on the orientation of the particle with respect to the cameras. And to see um, how big of an issue this is and how this changes with different particle shapes and different methods we use, we used a computational analog of the disco, so a digital twin, um, to estimate the error in different situations. The way it works is that based on an input PSSD, we sample some particles from that distribution of lengths and we randomly translate them and rotate them so they don't overlap into a virtual flow cell. Then we just project these particles onto the two planes, of which are the imaging planes of the camera. And then using the, um, the projections, we estimate some lengths using a certain method, use these to reconstruct the measured particle size distribution. And since we know what we input into the measurement simulation in the first place, we can then compare the two and see how it deviates and what accuracy we have. So we use this method, for example, to study the effect of aspect ratio. And to do this, we generated different populations, starting with an equant cube, oops, and then changing the L1 over L2 aspect ratio to generate more needle-like particles. And the same with the other aspect ratio, L2 over L3, to generate more plate-like particles. We varied the aspect ratio here from 1 to 5, and here as well. And then also when we combine aspect ratios, we get in the most extreme case, this kind of needle plate particle. We then use the oriented bounding box method to estimate the lengths based on the 3D reconstruction of the particle. And we assumed uniformly randomly distributed orientations. And if we now look at the relative errors on the thickness, we can see that they increase strongly with the L2, L3 aspect ratio, and that even at an aspect ratio of five, it already reaches about 200% on average. So the more plate-like, the larger the error. So when we want to, let's say, test our approach, we want to know how it performs on uh, multiple populations, not just a single one. And for that, we generated a test set which the idea behind it is that we have multiple populations which represent the populations that we could encounter in the disco in our measurement device. And luckily that space is limited by a few constraints. For example, they have to fit through the flow cell and that has a diameter or a width of two millimeters. So we said that the lengths can be at most a thousand microns we also have a lower limit of the camera resolution, so particles below 10 microns we cannot really characterize in a reasonable way, so we drop them. And finally, per definition, L1 is always larger than L2 and is always larger than L3. The space, it, you can visualize it something like this, where here is the tiniest cube, 10 by 10 by 10, here the biggest cube, 1000 by 1000 by 1000, here is the most extreme plate and the most extreme needle and everything else is in between. Then we first sample 100 population centers and around each population center, we sample a thousand particles each. In total, that gives us then 100,000 data points. If we now evaluate the oriented bounding box method on this test set, we see that the distribution starts at about zero and then has a long tail up to even 500% relative error. And on average, the error is 140%. So this is not really satisfactory for our purposes. So we were wondering if we can somehow make better use of the information we already have. And to achieve this, we trained a machine learning model to estimate the lengths based on the visual information we have. We did this in three steps. So first we generated our own data. And the reason we did this is because it allows us access to the ground truth, like I showed previously in the simulation of the measurement. Then we manually did feature engineering because it gives us more control over what trends the model could possibly be picking up on versus if we just use something like a convolutional neural network or something. 
And finally, we optimize the model, like comparing different models, for example, and tuning the hyperparameters. But first, to the data generation. We did this similarly as before. We just tried to cover the whole space of possible lengths, but this time sampled um, a million particle lengths to really cover it. We also added some non-cuboidal particles to the training set so that it would extrapolate better to different morphologies. So for example, we have this hexagonal platelet, some octagonal platelets, and these diamond-shaped platelets. Then with all these lengths and different morphologies, we simulate the measurement just as before. We rotate the particles, project them, and reconstruct the particle. And then from the 2D contours we get and the 3D reconstruction of the particle, we extract the shape features. So for example, circularity and convexity, and also to give the model an idea of the scale of the object, we also give it the contour areas and the volume of the reconstructed particle. Then we pre-process these features by centering and scaling them and correcting for skewness. And we eliminated some of them based on correlation and also using recursive feature elimination. We tried different techniques, for example, regression trees, support vector machines, and artificial neural networks, and optimize the hyperparameters of each of them, and then chose the simplest best. So that means we first find the best, and then we find the simplest one, which is still within the standard deviation of that performance. And for all of these steps, we use seven-fold cross-validation and averaged 10 models to make it more robust. Our final best model then is an artificial neural network with two layers, 40 nodes per layers and 17 features. If we now compare the error with the previous error with the oriented bounding box approach, we see that the, it's kind of almost a Gaussian distribution around zero, and it has reduced the average relative error to 33%, which is, I think, a big improvement compared to the 140%. Now, we already improved it a lot, but we were wondering if there was still a way to maybe make it better. And if we could make it better or not depends on what the reason for the remaining error is. And for this, there's two hypotheses. So first, we could have maybe not trained the model adequately. Maybe there was a better model, or we could have optimized the features a bit better. Or it could have been that there's just not enough information in the images to extract a more accurate length. And the way we tested which one of these is the case is we retrained the model with uh, the same particles, but all the particles are now, instead of randomly oriented, they're oriented in a way that one of the cameras always sees the thin side or the L3 perfectly. So the turquoise projection here. And we use the same hyperparameters as before. And when we compare now the performance of the model with the uniformly random alignment with the one of the perfect alignment, we see that the error goes down to 1%. So the model is, in theory, if it has access to the information possible of extracting the lengths pretty much perfectly. But unfortunately, in reality, it cannot because the particles aren't aligned to that. However, maybe we could improve it further if we added more cameras or more projection, just more input information. And maybe you remember the dependence of the error on the aspect ratio. And this is, of course, also a bit bad because when you have a crystallization process, the shape may change over time. And if then the error is not just a fixed value, but some um, some function of the shape, it's, it could lead to very misleading results. And now when we use the machine learning model instead, we see that in most areas, it's much better. For needles, it's a bit worse. So here it has a slight underestimation of the thickness, but the, also the difference between the highest and the lowest point it is smaller than before. We also checked how the error depends on the crystal morphology. So first, here you see the relative error distribution for the cuboidal particles, which looks same as the average one because they make up the majority of the set. 
And then for um, the diamond ones, it's a bit worse because it tends to overestimate the thickness quite a bit. And the reason why I think this is happening is because a cuboidal particle, when it's not aligned straight, can look a bit like a diamond particle. And maybe the machine learning model, when it sees this shape, these projections, thinks it's just a cuboidal particle that is tilted somehow and then undercorrects the thickness because of that. For the other two shapes, so the octagonal and hexagonal platelets, it looks pretty good as well. It's almost the same as the cuboidal ones. So an intermediate conclusion. So we use the computational analog or digital twin of the DISCO or stereoscopic, stereoscopic imaging device to compare different approaches to characterize plate-like particles. And then we also used it to train a machine learning model to estimate the lengths. And that turned out to be more accurate than the more straightforward approach of just using an oriented bounding box. If you're more interested in, sorry, if you're interested to learn more about the details of the training of the model and its performance, the, this QR code here will link you to the paper. Now, however, there's a slight flaw in this, which is that the computational analog is not a perfect replication of reality. For example, there's no blur simulated here and it assumes this uniform random distribution of particles, which we don't know really what the actual orientation distribution is. Maybe the needles align more with the flow or something like that. So ideally, we'd also experimentally validate this to check if our errors are actually as low as we think they are. Um, however, to do this, we need some particles. We need to measure some particles with the device of which we know the true length. And this can be done in two ways. Either we use an analytical standard with known lengths, or we measure the same particles with another device, which is more accurate than ours, and then compare the output of our device to the measured with the other device. Now, at the time, we didn't have, we couldn't find any of this for sale. So we collaborated with a microfluidics group from ETH, so Professor Andrew de Melo's group, and they helped us produce a novel analytical standard. So we used photolithography to produce these litho platelets by spinning a resin on a plate to get a certain thickness and then selectively exposing it to UV through a photo mask so that the parts that are exposed to UV harden and the rest stays liquid. So then when we wash them, we just get these platelets. We use this to produce seven populations of particles. Uh, the first set has 33 microns thickness, the second 66, and the last 100. They all are a width of 100 microns, and the lengths vary from 100 to 300 microns. We then um, wash off the resin, as I said. Um, we resuspend them in a mixture. Sorry. Um, Okay, we resuspend them in a mixture that is meant to prevent aggregation. And then we measure them with the disco. And here's a video of them flowing by. You can see they're nicely separated. And then we process the data with the machine learning algorithm I just showed before and get out our measured distributions, which we then can compare to the known lengths and see how well our model performs in reality. So I'll show platelets with specific measured lengths, where the thickness is always shown here on the diagonal below, the width on top, and the length on the side. Um, here's our ideal platelets with the width 33. First, let's look at the smallest one. So here is the distribution of this shape that we measured. And just a reminder, these, this blob in the middle are the isosurfaces that enclose 80, 50, and 25% of the image particles. And on the planes, we have the marginal distributions of this distribution. So first, we can see that in the L1, L2 plane, the result is fairly accurate, kind of clustered around 100 and 100, which is the actual length and width. And in L3, there is quite a spread. 
and the average is actually around 48. So it's overestimating L3 a bit and it has the worst spread in L3. But to me, that kind of makes sense because that, as I showed before, is the length that we have the least visual information about. If we then look at the other two, we see that in the L2, L3 plane, the distributions mostly overlap, which is good because they actually have the same L2 and L3 in reality, and that the error in L3 gets better a bit, and the distribution is not as widespread in this direction. Anna, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, a couple of minutes, you should uh, wrap it up. Okay, <laughs> then um, I'll skip these two. They're similar anyways, except the error is a bit smaller. And then you can see that when we plot all of them together, uh, the, um, the measured L3 increases with the actual L3. And finally, we also compared it to the oriented bounding box model. And as you can see, um, the spread is much smaller in the machine learning model, and it's more accurate. And even in L1 and L2, where there wasn't such a big problem to begin with, the machine learning model performs better. So to conclude, we have a production route for a cuboidal analytical standard. And we demonstrate that we are capable of measuring three characteristic lengths of micron-sized platelets suspended in a liquid. And since uh, the little platelets are monodispersed, we can also evaluate the precision and the accuracy of the measurement pipeline. We observe an absolute average error between 10 and 20 microns and standard deviations of about 50 microns in each length. And now we are using this tool in two ways, namely one of them is shape manipulation. So we try to get from less equine platelets to more equine platelets by a cycle of growth milling and dissolution. And we are just about to publish a paper where we study the effect of operating conditions on this process and on the result. And the lengths we measured here was done with the machine learning algorithm. And another thing we're working on is to kind of try to predict filtrability or permeability of a cake from the particle size and shape distribution by first measuring crystals and then filtering them. And we're also working on a model that models the packing structure. And yes, that's the end. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Anna, for the very nice uh, talk. Um, so um, we are running late, but um, I think we can we can take uh, one quick question, which uh, uh, requires a quick answer. Um, let me remind you that you can ask the question in the um, question and answer chat. Anna, can you see uh, the questions? There are a couple that are popping up. Um, uh, maybe I would start with the first one. Uh, so I'm reading the question aloud. Uh, my question is that some crystals have a high agglomeration tendency. Therefore, it is a bit difficult to think of crystals growing individually, depending on the agglomeration degree. Uh, the aspect ratios of the crystals can be quite different. Can we accurately determine the particle sizes of crystals with a high tendency to agglomerate with this technique? Um, yeah, so um, as I explained in the presentation, at the moment we just filter out agglomerates because the only way we characterize them is the volume. And we don't have any technique right now to separate it into primary particles, but I think the volume can still give you some indication of if there's growth happening or something. Yeah. Very good. So I'll classify this as a question that was answered uh, during the talk. If you want, you can either, while the other speakers are talking, uh, write the answer in the box, or we can wait to the end of all the presentations and go back to these questions. Thank you very much, Anna, Thank again. You, I think, yeah, no, that's okay, no worries. Um, I think we can move to the second uh, speaker, uh, Akim Olaleye. Um, so Akim got a master from Cranfield University, a PhD from University of All, then moved to University of Limerick uh, for a postdoc and is now a senior research engineer, crystallization engineer at APC in Ireland. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you just need to share the screen. Perfect. I'll just share my slides then now.
Can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to the talk. Um, today I'll be um, talking through um, artificial intelligence and crystallization development, specifically focusing on um, process monitoring using um, image analysis. Yeah, sorry. Um, just as uh, Martin um, Daniel introduced me, um, I came, so I work for APC as a senior research engineer. Uh, my background is chemical engineering. Um, APC VLE um, is a um, contract research um, organization based out in Dublin. Uh, we are literally just um, about 30 minutes from uh, um, the um, Irish um, coast, east, um, coastline. And then we're just about a um, few minutes away from the Wicklow uh, mountain. Um, we are generally focused on drug development for um, both the pharmaceutical and um, biopharmaceutical um, <clears throat> sectors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Through these um, three uh, pillars that you can see on the screen, um, our best in class CMC through our APC um, um, R and D um, activities, and then we also have um, um, a first in class digital uh, platform which takes care of our, um, all our um, clients and CMC decisions, um, both in the cloud and um, all digital with no pens or notes so that they can track the success of their drugs. And then also on site, we have um, Science First GMP facilities um, for both um, uh, uh, biopharmaceutical uh, drug uh, development. And we are made up of um, a multidisciplinary team, so which means we can take um, um, workflow from CMC and track transfer up onto uh, regulatory filing to um, assist um, our clients in their developmental um, um, push um, today I'll be, um, here's a little overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll just be concentrating more on um, looking at challenges of industrial crystallization and then the application of um, deep learning based image analysis, which I'll um, abbreviate as DLIA um, in subsequent slides. And I'll show you a bit of the workflow around that and then talk to you briefly about um, the data preparation and the model development. And then I will showcase some of the application, both for offline analysis and for uh, process monitoring and event tracking during the crystallization process. And then I'll conclude with some summary and acknowledgement. Um, if time permits, and if, depending on the question, I have a couple of um, appendix slides just to talk through on some other details that might come up in the conversations. Um, so in, um, in general, uh, control and analysis of um, industrial crystallization outcomes, either in situ and in the real time, is a very important aspect um, in the drive to either optimize the performance of our crystallization or even to um, um, support the downstream processes like um, filtrations and uh, drying. And currently, um, most um, in situ analyses are carried out by process analytical technologies such as um, FVRM, um, EasyViewer, or PVM, and some other offline uh, analysis like using uh, the Malvern and, and WaterView. Uh, to be able to characterize both the shape, shape and sizes of the particles and using their quantitative um, data to then infer things like um, qualitative description of either events or outcomes of the crystallization. Now, the challenges with some of these current systems are there are a lot of uncertainties in the measurement from the PATs, primarily because of the nature of the PATs themselves. Uh, sometimes you have a lot of, um, um, in, in terms of the image-based uh, um, PATs, for example, you could have, depending on your system, a very turbid um, solution or even a very um, high density slurries, which becomes really difficult to really pinpoint anything in an image. Or even um, for FVR, when you have very high aspect ratio needles, just as um, Anna alluded to in her presentation, uh, the challenges of this system can, I mean, in, in, an, in essence, either be um, supported with the use of an offline analysis um, tools like the Malvern, the Morphology G3, or even the SEM. But these are not feasible when you want to, um, it's at which you want to carry out a process development in situ. And this is where the application of um, deep learning comes in. Now, before I go into that, to demonstrate the use of some of these classical PATs like um, FVRM and PVM um, in industrial crystallization, 
here on the slide, I'm showing uh, you a case study of um, a combined cooling and solvent crystallization of um, benzoic acids. And in this chart, um, and, the and the accompanying um, the chart on the top here, and the accompanying image, and the, um, the PSD you have um, on the bottom right, um, what you're seeing is a five critical events that are identified. Um, the distribution shown on the bottom right is the distribution obtained at, those, um, at the end of each of those events. Now, the dashed lines are the primary cord length counts, and then the the, the thick lines are the uh, the weighted, the square weighted um, 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 distribution. And the reason is because, as most people will have known in this field, when you are dealing with high aspect ratio crystals, um, the FBRM counts is usually skewed towards the uh, the fine particles. And in some cases, to be able to home in on the um, the large um, counts or, or crystals, you do a bit of a um, uh, mathematical um, adjustment in terms of looking at the uh, the higher uh, or macro count. Now, what you notice there in the, in in the uh, image above the 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 the, the solid line, what you notice is that the system involves itself starts from um, heating. Although here I'm only showing the cooling stage, so the the first um, stage here, which is equivalent to the image A here, corresponds to the cooling. So you will cool from 40 degrees to about 20 degrees. And then that's um, from points at the end of point A, which is shown here as well with the magenta picture, or even with the, with the shifted one as well. You 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 see that um, you see the, uh, the um, nucleation starting. You, you you see the counts increased, and then what you notice, which is uh, shown by the the count of the um, less than one thousand um, chord lengths. Now when you go into the um, section B, which is the antisolvent addition at the end of B, you notice there's a big drop. Well, not big. There's a, there's, a, there's an increase in uh, nucleation, which is shown by the movement in terms of the uh, from the magenta to the blue. And at the same time, you will see a, a very small shift to the right of the PSD, which shows that there's also um, growth happening. Now, in stage C, which is basically just hold after the antisolvent addition. Both in the weighted and the unweighted um, distribution, you notice that there's minimal change in that, which I mean, simply because there's no real um, change happening. Now, when you come, the next thing we then do is um, to cool this further down to zero degrees C to either shift your supersaturation curve a bit to get more nucleation. You see a big jump between um, the blue coffee and the red. The red is the D line where we have the second um, um, stage. And then E is just another old for about two hours after the crystallization. Now, this is a classical way we use um, um, FBRM and the accompanying image. And you will also notice the trend between image A to E, how the sizes increases between D is where we have the um, the cooling, where you see the, the, the high big jump in from the needle crystals to rod-shaped um, larger crystals here. And that's a classical example of what we do with um, FBRM. And at the same can be said, if we go to um, the easy viewer. So the easy viewer is another imaging um, um, PAT, which in this case you measured. It has a, a tool called image to code, which you can use to also train the code length. Now the distribution is the same, but in some cases because this is image based, you might find a bit of a difference in the counts estimated compared to uh, the FBRM. Now the the limitations of these um, tools are especially when you want to. Um, also include things like particle size measurement. The been researchers looking at converting code length to particle size or particle size distribution. Now, these are not usually effective. Now, to be able to actually use um, the, 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 the measurement from these experiments in terms of to be uh, to infer morphology or events, then a better approach would be to actually look for a way to um, characterize this. And this is where um, deep learning, because you have, uh, especially convolutional um, neural network or computer vision application comes in, where you take the image as it is, and then you analyze them, segment them, and then um, you can then start extracting um, measurements and then inferring things like um, process um, conditions. Now, the question would be then, why? Will you want to use a deep learning or a, a machine learning based um, algorithm for image analysis when there are a lot of classical and image processing technique? I think I'm not sure some of them. You could use things like thresholding. Now, the most, the key part of uh, any image um, processing step is the segmentation itself, which is basically the process of dividing an image into different um, regions, on, and then which we then start characterizing the pixels. 
to identify either object or boundary simply in that image to then start uh, extracting measurements. Uh, the, the challenge with uh, classical analysis is that when you start having things like overlapping agglom or agglomerated particles or even high aspect ratio um, um, particles in high density slurry system like you will find in common um, industrial crystallization, it becomes difficult to use um, a classical um, image analysis algorithm because they tend to uh, struggle when you have um, either irregular um, um, texture in your image or when, when there's no clear distinction between the foreground and background and image. So this is where um, using a machine learning or a neural network based segmentation can really help because in that case, you are actually analyzing the images as a human will see it because of the more complexity. Now, the next thing I'll go through is to talk through the workflow that we um, um, follow through in APC to achieve this. Um, so the, the first thing we do then is um, for the workflow, it's divided into these three key areas, which is the image acquisition. And this can be either through most a lot of our um, experimental activities on sites supported with the, the PAT tools, or in some cases we we do explore use of some of our historical data sets, which we are curated over the uh, the years. And then the next phase then is the image um, annotation itself, another important task um, to be to extract some features and then classify the image to form a ground truth that goes into uh, the third bit, which is the convolutional neural network. And that is where the model development itself comes in. You will train and validate the model. And in some cases, we might require to apply some um, augmentation to the images, either to be able to generalize more and then also tune some of the uh, important um, hyperparameters. Um, after that, the, uh, the important part for us is then the application, either integration or deployment into some of our workflow, either for offline analysis or even in real-time event um, tracking. Um, here is a summary of um, a bit into detail of the model development itself. So like I said, once we get those images from our experiments, we split, you, you divide the images to annotated ones. We can keep maybe about a few percentage for um, inferencing later. Now the annotated images are split using um, um, maybe a 90 to 10% uh, ratio of the training set to validation sets. And then the backbone of our model itself is the uh, convolutional neural network, which is basically an object detection or uh, instance segmentation model to train um, a, a, a neural network model. Now, we might have to also include some hyperparameter optimization, especially to deal with issues of overfitting or picking um, um, erroneous um, instances as crystals. And then once we have a working model, we wrap that around uh, um, image analysis toolkit for um, to support most of our process development activities around um, that. Now, the first um, part of that involves a data preparation itself, which includes things like um, annotating the images, applying some data augmentation, which is basically generating some synthetic data to include some variability into data sets, and then the model itself. Um, here, just a snapshot of um, our annotation plat uh, platform where you take the image from different, so we've gone through different um, experiments. Now, these are just our own in-house classification based on the 2D um, images we get from most of our PAT, starting from very um, easy to annotate images of droplets or bubbles to really high aspect ratio. So we cover the spectrum of from aspect ratio of one to as high as maybe 20, just to be able to give us more uh, flexibility. And these were span over about um, 2,000 images into almost about um, 7,000 different um, um, instances in each of uh, in all those data sets together. Now, once we do that, the other thing we uh, we we do in some cases is we do a bit of a data augmentation, depending on if we have um, some some section of um, our data that is missing. So, so for example, if I go to uh, there's a link here. If if you're interested in that where we actually apply some um, data augmentation to our data set. So what you have here is an example of an original um, image, and then you just rotate this by 90 degrees, or in some cases, apply rotation and blur. So what, we, what this gives us is it increases our data set, and then at the same time, it helps decrease overfitting by improving um, the training. On the, on the left here, you see a bit of overfitting here, where the, uh, the, the, the boundary is pretty jagged, 
And then when you improve the training data and the and the network, the, the, the prediction becomes better. And this is one of the advantages of um, doing um, data augmentation. Now, the next step then is the model development itself. So in general, most of our uh, uh, CNN is basically uh, mascar CNN, which is a, um, an improvement to the faster uh, region um, uh, based uh, convolutional neural network. Now, and what that does simply is that the faster CNN is basically an object detection um, algorithm, but the mask CNN adds a bit of a max generation to it. And the, the reason you need a max generation is, for example, if you want to count the number of instances of a particular class of crystals or crystal in an image, so it does a bounding box and then had the instance classification to it. And this is just a snippet of what um, a code will look like in uh, Python. Now, the, the next important aspect is actually the application. So we've gone through some of um, our models to date, in, uh, applying them in offline measurement to support things like where you have images from experiment and you need to extract some uh, shape or size uh, descriptors like aspect ratio, secularity, or even size distribution. And then most, most recently, we start applying them on monitoring or even um, annotating events during a crystallization supported with the image analysis. Um, here is one of um, a snapshot of some of um, what our trained model looks like. Um, on the left here is an instance of droplets in an experiment, and then you can see uh, the the prediction. Now, around with droplets and bubbles, it's easier because the, the shapes are not very complex. And then also, you, in some cases, you might have clusters or agglomerates. This can happen either maybe when you have um, things like oiling out and the particles you form at the end of the day are not really good um, shape. We can use that to classify them. And then at the same time also, we could see, I mean, this is from uh, a microscope, which is one of those things we do with um, um, some of our uh, data. We can uh, see those for offline analysis. Now, so we've been able to go from a very smooth spherical shape to needles with um, a validated model so far. Now, the the other important aspect is actually using the uh, the live experiment and data itself to generate these metrics like um, size or shape um, characteristics, and then that supports some of our um, work. And to do that, we also have to be able to at least benchmark it with some of the uh, the classical uh, measurements you have before it have with the FBRM. The easy view itself also has the image to code. And then once we know that, I mean, with known measurement, this is accurate, that helps us in building a tool that can be used for offline analysis. And the other aspect of our work then is to actually apply this in an online real-time crystallization, where instead of waiting for an experiment to finish or for uh, the whole process to run to then take your data away to do measurement, you can actually be characterizing the measurements to, to train things like counts, distributions, and then you can use those to infer um, um, changes to your process or maybe even set up the next experiment while before you, uh, uh, I mean, set up the planning for the next experiment based on the knowledge you get from, uh, from this in real time. And the benefits of that cannot be emphasized enough. Um, still looking at a bit of the application, what you're seeing here is um, the performance of our models so far on different PATs. So like I said, we do have on-site some images from microscope experiments or from even PVM that needs to either be analyzed to be able to measure some metrics that we tend to use as, um, as a descriptor or as a, um, as a um, um, critical quality attribute, either for uh, a process. For example, in a process where we want to track or trend and the, the changes in aspect ratio as measure of reliability or what have you. And the model predictions and the general test across these different PATs is, um, is being satisfactory to date. And then we've also validated this for different crystal shapes, either from droplet to um, needle. And on this slide, what I'm showing is a typical application of our deep learning uh, image analysis for tracking events. This is a parastamol um, crystal, I think. The image on the left here is the uh, is is the prediction you get after collecting those images and training it into our neural network. And then the deep learning image analysis model was developed as a toolkit for the offline analysis. And on the top here is the easy viewer um, count. And this is the prediction from going through the 
I think over a thousand images uh, frames that are collected during the experiment in the neural network in the um, our, in our codes. There's no big difference in terms of the trend, but you will notice that in some cases, because of what I mentioned earlier, the FBRM will tend to um, uh, be biased towards a fine count compared to when you're using a deep learning image analysis that tends to pick an instance and then it measures the code length based on those particular instance rather than uh, tiny collections of uh, finds. And on the right here is just looking at um, uh, the distribution. So from this, you can infer that this, this growth could see the shift from left to right in terms of the size. And at the same time, if you trend through uh, the time, and these are the kind of valuable insights you would need while developing, um, uh, working on a crystallization uh, process, especially as a case in industrial setting. Now I'll, I'll conclude my presentation with the snapshot I showed uh, at the beginning of the combined cooling and solvent uh, crystallization. But in this case, to, to be based on the deep learning um, analysis itself. Now with the deep learning, you see that we can track the different events from, um, from, from the accurate uh, quantitative data in situ and in real time. So here where I'm showing you is the code length distribution. So based on the images, you see that, like I, like I mentioned, um, B is after and solvent addition. So between A and B, you see there's, there's, there's already a, a, a nucleation happening. But then if you go to D, where we see the big jump, and this is, I think, where you have um, the, um, D is where you cool it further to, to shift the supercharturation um, line. And then you see that it also has the highest number of counts. Now, he, now I should also I should note I should note that um the, the the graph here is basically for that region two hours at the end not the entire uh, plus to the end but then you see that the, the the shape or the features of the two PSDs are the same which means nothing happened newly in this case now the advantage of the deep learning again is you can change not just this alone we can then specifically actually measure the uh the the two D PSDs of these particles, and that also tells you, you a bit about the uh, the process. You can see that I mean, in 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 general, there's 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 nucleation and growth. There's increase in, in size, and also visually, you can see that between D and between C to E, you can see the uh, the the difference in the shape, and these are pretty well captured in uh, the deep learning prediction as well. Another thing you can add to that is maybe you want to look at aspect ratio because that in itself also tells its own story in terms of uh, the the flowability or the uh, the choice of uh, um, um, the system that you are considering or, or looking at. Um, so in summary, I've been able to go through a bit of um, our deep learning um, uh, image analysis workflow for uh, industrial crystallization, looking at things like um, using it for both in situ and offline uh, measurements and to be able to generate some statistical um, um, data, which have been useful for evaluating things like changes in either the crystal properties or even trends during the, the crystallization. And this can be very useful as either a soft sense of monitoring uh, or even tracking um, the process when you, uh, when you have maybe countless of numbers of um, crystallization runs to look at. And then this is also useful to track different um, um, events such as maybe like nucleation growth or even agglomeration or breakage. And also it's it's pretty much um, similar in terms of what you want to detect things like um, um, sensitivity to specific um, process or, or, or approach. Um, that's generally my talk. It's a bit brief. Um, if there are any questions or take, if there are any specific question, I do have some backup slides on um, some of the details. Now, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my team, um, the the amazing team I work with in APC, and uh, some of our external collaborators, like those, um, the uh, Metla, and then um, the obvious um, academic collaborator working from uh, the University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague. Um, that's me, um, Daniel, yeah. I'll pass it back to Thank you. Thank you very much. Question. Yes, thank you very much, Akim, for this very nice presentation. Um, yes, um, time for questions. Again, uh, you can uh, the audience can formulate the questions uh, by using the question and answer box, uh, which is at the bottom of the slide. So I do have a question myself, but I'll start with one question that I see on the screen. 
Uh, maybe you can leave the presentation on and uh, yep. keep sharing. Um, so the question refers to slide nine. Uh, yep. There are some crystals not identified by the uh, machine learning, deep learning algorithm. Do they affect the performance evaluation? I'll go back to slide number nine. Yeah. We do not see the screen yet. Oh, okay. Did I stop sharing? I didn't. Yes, you did stop sharing. Okay, I'll share that back now. Yeah, now we see it again. Perfect. So slide number nine, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. That's this one. Yes. Yep. That's a that's a that's an interesting question. First of all, um, I should I should mention that um, during the training of most of our um, um, deep learning model rely majorly on images coming from Easy Viewer and PVM. Now, the third image you see on the right here is um, from I think a microscope. So, it's technically it will be possible for it not to pick those. And then secondly, when we are annotating, you annotate specific. Um, shapes, right? Now, if you look at this region that there's nothing here, even to a human eye, you can't really say these are needles. And I think Anna mentioned it in her presentation. It would be difficult to classify these as a crystals because what you see here is almost like a dendritic needle type uh, shape forming here. So in some instances, that might be the reason. In another instance also, for some of this prediction, there are thresholds that you specified. If you can see clearly, there are some percentages attached to each of these um, classes here which is saying that if any, anything that is less than 50% needle, based on what the model has been trained with, it shouldn't consider it. Now you can reduce or relax the threshold. It will increase the number of instances you get on each image. So based on that, you can do that. But secondly, also if the image or the instances are not really clear to a human to pick, then it will also be difficult for the uh, network to pick that. And, and I mentioned during one of the uh, slides I showed, that when you start picking things like that as a crystal, even though it looks like um, like a crystal that you can identify, but it's not really sure, it, your your network becomes biased and it starts overfitting. And it start, in some instances, you start picking things that are either out of um, focus. For example, also you don't want your, um, because if you want to use this for measurement, you want to actually have the right instance or the right segmentation across each of the image. So in, so in that way, you, you can, not pick everything. And don't forget that also here we have we are trending about maybe 10, 12 frames per second. So you do have a range of sample points to pick um, your uh, data, to select your data to um, to populate um, what you use for your measurement. So in that case, yes. But if it's just basically to count, you can, you can relax the, the threshold. Here, if I say I want to see just anything that's remotely close to a crystal by even 30, 20 percent, it might pick up on very on maybe mostly everything here. So that's 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 a price you have to pay for either you want more instances predicted or you want it to actually detect something that you can measure and give you a great um, um, size. All right. Thank you very much. That was a very clear answer. Um, so I think for the sake of time, I will ask you my question at the end. Yep when uh, you will appear magically with all the other speakers, uh, because probably this is something that I will ask also the other ones. So we, we move on. Yeah, thank you very much, Akim, again. Thank you. Um, so we move on to the third presentation of the webinar. Um, so the title is Machine Learning Algorithms in Population-Based uh, Crystallization Modeling. And uh, the presenter is um, Almos Orosh uh, from Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Almos, if you want, you can start uh, sharing your screen while I introduce you. Almos is a PhD student at the Budapest University of uh, uh, Technology and Economics. He um, is a second year PhD student, but he did work uh, on a similar topic when he was a master's student. So I'm not sure if it is me, uh, but uh, I do hear some windy noises in the background. Um, you start talking, yeah. and then if, if that's uh, problematic, yes, I'll I let you know. Yeah. <laughs> Go yes, ahead. Please, uh, let me know. Let me know if that noise is cancelled out with my microphone. Is it disturbing? 
No, for the moment, b before when we did the testing, it was a bit better, but but I think we can understand you. So, so uh, please go ahead. If if there is any issue, I will uh, um, I will let you know. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for that uh, sure. disturbance. That's uh, okay. So can you see my can Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, and then I, I presume you can hear me as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. As mentioned before, my name is Amo Soros. I'm a second year PhD student at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. And the topic that I'm going to talk about today is somewhere at the intersection of the application of machine learning based algorithms and the population balance based crystallization modeling. The outline of my presentation is the following. First, I'm going to talk about very briefly as an introduction about the machine learning and population balance based modeling. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a literature excursion, and I'm going to talk about the main branches of machine learning application in PBM. So I'm going to showcase a couple of um, promising research directions from all around the world that apply machine learning models, and that could provide valuable resu results to the domain of population balance modeling as well. And uh, after that, I'm going to, to present to you two of our contributions uh, from the Crystallization and Process Engineering Research Group from Budapest. The emergence uh, and widespread access to higher capacity computers and the exponential growth in data generating systems have paved the way for the popularity of, of AI and machine learning. And uh, many think today that they hold the promise of transforming our societies, industries, and technologies as we know it. And uh, due to their extremely successful application for everyday tasks, uh, the machine learning based publications have flooded the scientific research as well in the last seven years, as it can be seen on my graph on the lower right. The population balance modeling, however, compared to these rather black box modeling based techniques, a white box modeling technique that analyzes the population of particles and their change over time. And we can follow the evolution of this population uh, with the help of this uh, modeling technique. With the help of this modeling technique, we are able to, for example, simulate the transform from the continuous phase to the dispersed, dispersed phase, from, for example, in a crystallizer, and we can follow how the crystal population change during the process. Uh, this modeling technique tries to understand the distribution of particles and their change, the distribution of, part, of properties within a population, and their change due to some mechanisms like growth, dissolution, agglomeration, primary nucleation, or breakage. When we take a closer look to this equation, there are a couple of important terms to this equation. For example, the internal variable vector, which, which can be the crystal length or, or width, the rate of change of particle properties, and the position of the, crisp, of the particles in the reactor. So we follow uh, the evolution of a population in time, and we assign terms like growth, sink, or source terms, and with the help of these terms, and by solving the population balance equation, we can simulate crystallization processes or any other particular processes. This modeling technique had been applied by researchers and scientists to uh, do process optimization, control, to design better products, and to understand complex system behaviors. And despite the successful applications of the last 30, 40 years, there are still a couple of challenges to this modeling technique. In the following, I'm going to show a couple of challenges, an incomplete list of these related challenges. Uh, the first is that as um, that we population balance modelers are still in a need of advanced analytical techniques to identify crystal shape and n-dimensional -dimension, n crystal shape data to be able to build higher dimensional population balance models. The computational cost is a current challenge of population balance modeling, especially when we, when we want to apply complex models for real time. And lastly, we are also in a need of advanced data analytical techniques to analyze large simulated data sets for knowledge generation and to do process design and synthesis. In the following, I'm going to list a couple of promising research directions from different research groups that, uh, that are promising in terms of solving these challenges with the application of machine learning modeling. 
The first honorable mention on this list is a publication from Gao et al, who had developed a machine learning based, machine learning powered image analytical model to track the individual crystals of L glutamic acid. According to the publication, they were able to calculate process parameters like counts, size, surface area, crystal size distribution, morphology, and poly polymorphic form. And the noteworthy result of this publication is that they were, to able, they were able to distinguish between the different polymorphic forms on the basis of the crystal shape only. And uh, they were able to calculate with one piece of equipment the polymorphic form and the crystal size related and shape related data, which normally would have required at least two different um, instruments, for example, an in-situ FBRM or an image analytical technique. So, which is, it is a remarkable achievement of substituting one piece of, uh, two pieces of equipment with one and generating two dimensional size related data and uh, these research directions and others on the same track are beneficial for population balance and also crystallization modeling since they provide higher dimensional crystal shape data that can be fed into higher dimensional population balance model. And this way we will be able to exploit the capabilities of population balance modeling to model like morphology and different polymorphs using this modeling technique. The second Honorable mention on our list is that the recent publication of Sitapur et al, uh, who had published the Crystal GPT from the Texas University. Their model apply a time series transformer framework that has been trained on 20 different experimental crystallization data set. Their model that is structurally similar to natural language processing models is able to comprehend and synthesize a large data set of more than 10 million data points. Crystal GPT has been, GPT has been tested in terms of system to system transferability and model predictive control setups, and it showed high accuracy in both of these testing environments. And uh, these research directions could help researchers to build more general uh, predictions that can be transferred amongst crystallization systems. The second mention on this list is a recent publication, uh, again from Yerdalen et al. from CMAC, who had developed a machine learning based framework for the prediction of the probability of nucleation. First, they have executed a couple of crystallization experiments with different arrangements and calculated the corresponding induction time parameters, the nucleation rate, and growth time. After that, they also created the computational fluid dynamic based simulation of these experiments and calculated the corresponding hydrodynamic parameters. And then they have built separate um, machine learning models to predict these induction and time parameters from the hydrodynamic parameters of the experimental systems. And after successful model, calibration and uh, after achieving good prediction performance, they used the two separate models in an ensemble way to predict the probability of nucleation. This, this, this publication and others in a similar track can help researchers better understand fundamentals of crystallization to be able to build better this, uh, process designs or better models. And the last mention of our list is a recent publication of Raponi et al. from the University of Torino, who had developed a mirror model for speeding up the parameter estimation of population balance modeling techniques. This, uh, according to their idea, first they have simulated a couple of kinetic parameter and product size vector pairs using the population balance model, and then they have developed a deep neural network to predict the kinetic parameters from the product sizes. And this way, they were mirroring or inversing the traditional parameter estimation approach. Uh, after a successful machine um, be, um, uh, optimization or training of their model, they were able to predict the kinetic parameters from product sizes. And when they compared their simulations with the validation experiments, a good, exp uh, good um, agreement was revealed. And they also compared uh, their, their approach and the, and the uh, time of solution of their optimization algorithms with other traditional optimization techniques. And the remarkable tenfold decrease in time of solution 
was achieved. This publication and others in this track can help modelers more quicker build their uh, population balance models. And this way, uh, engineers and researchers can more easier and more quicker apply the model-based design and model-based control, for example. And after these introductory si slides, I'm going to talk about a recent publication of our research group, which is about the synthetic machine learning framework for in silico knowledge generation for unknown crystallization system. When one tests the same technology on different crystallization system, it can happen that there are recurrent patterns for the best technological um, settings and alternatives. And this is a good and a good example for this phenomenon is the parabolic cooling profile, which can work across crystallization mm -hmm. systems. And in each crystallization, crystallization system, this parabolic cooling profile can help reduce the effect and the unwanted effect of secondary nucleation. One of the goals with this publication was to investigate whether it's possible to find a couple of these recurrent patterns using only an in silico database. And if it's uh, possible, then can we find some driving motiva motivating factors of decisions regarding process development. So when one tries to uh, start a new technology, uh, it can happen or set up a new crystallization system. It can happen that there is no knowledge or data available for quickly test all the te competing technological alternatives. And in these situations, when we are in lack of time and resources, we may not evaluate high risk, high return technologies, but we may stuck in legacy systems, potentially missing on possible advantages of the new technology. So in this work, our goal was to demonstrate that generating in silico knowledge, necessary knowledge in silico before experimentation or plant scale intervention with minimized humane implications may be possible. So our machine learning based, synthetic machine learning based framework can cover the following steps. So first we have a problem statement. So we are in a need of a new technology. After that, we can list all the competing technological alternatives on a professional basis. And then we can build a high fidelity first, prin first principle models of each of these technologies. And then we can generate a set of optimal solutions. And then we can apply model mining based technology selection to know which technology best suits our ob objectives. And then a data guided experimental design space validation can take place. And this way we can uh, at least make an approximation using only in silico data that which process best could and best could best fit our needs. To demonstrate this framework, we have chosen the process of second, second order asymmetric transformation of enantiomers, which is a crystallization and deracinization based resolution technique. This technique is efficient for the separation of conglomerates. And it has potential for simultaneous PSD control as well. And in the case study, we also combine this deracinization and resolution technique with the intensification using integrated wet milling. So with the technique of, technique of crystallization integrated wet milling. When someone thinks about the combination of these two techniques, there are a couple of difficulties inherently in this combination. The first is that there are many parallel sub-processes of the deracinization process, which would make it hard to experimentally map the design space. And the second problem is that about the combination of these two techniques, there is only a limited amount of operational experience. So these two last difficulties makes the combination of these two techniques a great candidate to test our machine learning based framework on. Since by generating in silico knowledge, we can have some background knowledge when we start our process development. So when someone thinks about the combination of these two techniques, it can, uh, a couple of questions can arise. So do we really need this intensification by milling for every system? If not, then how to know when it is necessary or with what anti-purity should we expect at the end of the process? And uh, in this work, we were trying to generate some in silico knowledge to be able to find out which are the main driving factors to be 
uh, to answer these questions. And to answer these questions as general as possible, let's generate a synthetic database of optimal operations. First, when someone or when we just do one process optimization, the norm normal workflow is the following. So first, we just set some objectives and then we do global optimization and then it will result us one optimal operation with the dynamic temperature profile and dynamic milling profile. At the end of the global optimization, we can see that in that one particular process, we have, for example, maximal product energy or purity, optimal product PSD, minimal energy, and we will see that what kind of milling profile did our optimization algorithm choose for our best uh, cases. However, we wanted to find out whether we generate a large set of optimal operation. Is it possible to recognize some recurrent patterns to be able to form a general good answer for this particular process using our in silico data set? To be able to do that, first we have selected um, five technology and three kinetic related uh, parameters and assigned reasonable intervals to them. After that, we have created 1,293 combinations and executed global optimization on each of these combinations. This way, it resulted us a large set of optimal operations. When we were analyzing these results, it turned out there are uh, results which differ from each other in a great extent. For example, these two outcomes can be, this can be seen here. In the first set of results, or in some results, there were temperature cycles chosen by the global optimization algorithm, and the milling was also incorporated. And in some cases, the, temp the um, temperature cycles degenerated back into a parabolic cooling, pro cooling profile, and there was no uh, milling included. So we were trying to investigate and analyze the results a bit more. And we have found out that in around 40 of the cases, the wet milling is not involved at all, or, or only, it is only uh, involved in a neg negligible level. And, and uh, to investigate this uh, phenomenon a bit more, we have developed the classification algorithm using the XG boost method to be able to find out that upon the, sim the same eight input parameters, how can we classify between the cases where we in are in a need of the integrated system or where we should only apply the crystallizer? So here we can see the results of the classification uh, algorithm building. So upon sufficient training, we were able to excellently answer the rather Shakespeare question of to mill or not to mill. And as we can see here, the, the confusion matrix is, um, shows a high accuracy for the testing cases, since the area under the curve value is larger than 0 0.95. And um, upon this successful machine learning uh, training, we can uh, use our machine learning model for the calculation of the Shapley values of our parameters, which tell us the importance of each of these parameters uh, when making this classification decision. And as we can see, the racemization rate, the relative L2D seed size and the initial temperatures are the most important driving factors in this question. So this way, by doing this classification algorithm and applying this machine learning framework on the synthetic data, we are able to provide some insights into the process development following steps in the future when Stormer starts combining these two techniques. And similarly, this um, to these previous um, steps, we have developed another machine learning for the model for the prediction of enantiomer excess processes on the basis of these eight param uh, parameters as well. And we have used the random forest phase regression to uh, obtain it. And uh, as we can see here, our results show the good test, per test performance for the prediction of uh, enantiomer excess. And we can see that in this particular case, the racemization rate, the number of temperature cycles, and relative L to D seed size parameters have the largest Shapley values, which is a surprising outcome that the growth rate and the nucleation rate, which are more harder to determine measures, have less importance in this question. In our corresponding publication, we have also observed the effect 
and cases of D10, D50, D90, and the temperature cycles as well. So if you're interested, you can read, you can further read about this in our publication. And uh, amongst our future plan is to analyze the results using time series, similarity analysis as well. And to conclude this part of my presentation, I could say that uh, we have demonstrated within this work that it may be possible to generate meaningful insight for process development processes using mostly in silico uh, generated simulational data. And uh, starting my last part of my presentation um, now, which is about the application of physics info neural network for the simulation of crystallization processes. The solution of partial differential equations can cause serious challenges for standard numerical solvers, especially when there are significant nonlinearities in the systems. And this can cause in so slow simulation of important processes. A recent studies suggest that the application of deep neural network can help us in this situation by building meta models to quickly simulate dynamic systems. Um, this attribute is thought to be true due to the assumption that uh, the deep neural, deep neural network can be in some conditions um, at, um, thought of as universal, universal function approximators. And the physics info neural network is a relatively new research direction in this field. According to this idea, during the training of the neural network, the physics of the system, so the underlying model equations, for example, partial differential equations or systems of ordinary differential equations are embedded into the model architecture of the neural network. So during training, not only the training data, but also the physics of the system are accounted for. This incorporation of the physical laws into the neural network could result in less need for extensive data sets, and it can increase the chance of better predictive and generalization performance of our neural network. The physics info neural network framework has been used to solve inverse problems, to simulate partial differential equations, and to speed up slow simulations. In the following, I'm going to demonstrate how we apply this uh, machine learning framework for the simulation of crystallization processes and the solution of population balance models. For the demonstration of this um, framework and the combination of these two techniques, I've used a rather simple and quick way to approximate population balance modeling, uh, population balance equations, uh, solution which is the standard method of moments, which is a first length-based um, arrangement. And uh, for the data-driven part of a neural network first we have to generate some samples which i've done by simulating a couple of sample points of the moments during the crystallization process and uh, in the first approach i try to predict the moments of the crystal population during the crystallization only from the time points of these samples and during training the difference between the predictions of the neural network and these sample points was minimized however in this case uh, we can only predict those points well in uh, our with our neural network that had been shown to, that been shown during training to the neural network, and if we want to also simulate the dynamics of these systems using only these sample points, we should apply when we can apply the physics info neural network framework. To be able to do that first one should apply some collocation points that are just more time points on the time domain that are used to differentiate the solution of the neural network using automatic differentiation. And this way, the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the system of ordinary differential equations can be quantified and minimized during training. So this arrangement can be thought of the bootstrapping, which is similar, which is a, which is kind of a technique that can help us um, without drastically changing our model's architecture, we just use our existing uh, input data in a more smarter, more smarter arrangement. So um, during training, uh, in an ideal case, the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is minimized. And uh, this means that basically the, 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 during training, the neural network is guiding, guided 
uh, towards the solution of the system of ordinary differential equation. And in an ideal case, we just simply solve the system of differential equations. So in the following, I'm going to demonstrate quickly um, three case studies, just very quickly, just uh, flash them here, that uh, when I apply this framework for the simulation of crystallization processes, first is the case when their inc incorporated mechanisms are the secondary nucleation and the growth. Here we can see the first case when there is only the data points incorporated in the training. We can see that only the sample points are predicted well, which are shown to the neural network a priori. But after that, when the physics for neural network based physics loss is also incorporated in the objective function of the neural network, we can see that by applying only these four sample points, the whole dynamics of the system is predicted accurately. Of course, when we calculate the average crystal size concentration and crystal number, there is some deviation between the neural network's prediction and the numerical uh, solution. Mm, there is this is the room for improvement with the model design. This is why these are just called some preliminary results. But when we compare the speed of solution of the uh, neural network and the Python SciPy's library solve IVP ODE solver, we can see that the physics info neural network can cause some slight increase in solution speed. In the second case, I wanted to be a bit more practical and apply uh, instead of the sampling of the moments, I sampled from an in silico experimental data. So first I generated some average crystal size and concentration data during the process and fitted my physics info neural network up on these input data, which are directly measurable values. And after, up, upon sufficient training, we can see that the dynamics of the whole process is well predicted using only these five sample points. There are still some uh, deviation, but there are, in this case, generally less than 5%. And when we compare the speed of solution, we can see that the physics info neural network is two times faster than the solve IVP of the Python's library. And my last example is a volume-based um, um, standard method of moment solver that incorporates agglomeration and breakage as well, which uh, these two me mechanisms are selected since they are known for causing um, non-linearities in the system and, and resulting in slower simulations. And uh, we can see as well that the end of the optimization, our system it predicts well the whole dynamics of the crystallization. And in this case, there are more room for improvement since there are larger deviations between the, the predictions at the beginning, but uh, at the end, the, the precision is quite okay. And the solution time in this case is uh, increased by seven uh, times so our in our future plans i um, i have to uh, i have in, in amongst my future plans to improve the precision of my current results i'd like to extend this framework to more complicated cases and i'd like to apply a couple of machine learning based uh, techniques to improve this uh, framework but uh, this is what i could talk about today in connection to physics info neural networks applications and to conclude my presentation I can just quickly say that the machine learning modeling can be an invaluable tool in crystallization, crystallization modeling. There are many promising research directions that can serve valuable results for the domain of population balance modeling, and that uh, there are still challenges, but machine learning may help researchers tackle these challenges in the future. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please just text me in the Q&A section. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very, very nice presentation. Um, so let's go for one question for um, Almos, uh, and then we invite all the speakers again uh, for the uh, remaining 20 minutes that we have for a sort of a global panel discussion. So I'll go, um, I do have several questions myself, but I see I've been uh, uh, anticipated by some of the people um, attending the conference. So I'll start with the question of, uh, Another Daniele. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Armos. Uh, regarding the solution time, I assume that doesn't include in situ generation and neural network training. Can you discuss how many samples you drew and, and structure and how long uh, training took? Uh, yes, thank you for the thank you for the uh, answer. These are very good uh, um, questions. Thank you. So the the data generation is just a couple of seconds since these OD solvers are very 
very very uh, fast and the training time yes this is a at, at the moment the training is uh, quite fast it takes a couple of hours to train the neural network model itself so in general it takes it's a it's a longer time of course uh, but it, it is due to the neural networks uh, like um, capabilities to incorporate the physics loss as well which in that case it has to uh, cover all the dynamics and this is slows down its process to catch all the dynamics in the system so it, it at the moment it is a it is a longer process but we are working on to reduce the model's complexity to make it a more robust and quicker way to train these machine learning models yeah and of course once uh, the neural network has been trained it can be used uh, as many times as uh, one wants um as um, for, 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 for as when you fit the model. Um, so maybe a follow-up question on this. Um, in some cases, um, you train a model because you are interested in uh, using the kinetics because you want to have uh, predictions from the model itself. Um, in some other cases, instead, for example, you might be interested in uh, knowing the nucleation rate or the grow rate or the aggregation break or the aggregation and breakage rates. Um, just because you want to do some very simple back on the back of the envelope calculations that uh, would help you in designing a crystallizer. So with PIN, you can get predictions with good training. What about the rates and the kernels and the numbers? Uh, do you do you get them? How do, can you get them? I'm sorry, over the kernels. Could you repeat the question about the yeah. kernels? I, I'm basically asking. You can. Uh, you, you, uh, with the pin, you get uh, predictions over time of uh, particle size distribution, moments of the distribution, whatever you want. What about the rates? In some cases, you care more about the nuclear, knowing the nucleation rate or the grow rate than the predictions. Uh, so with pin, is there a way that you can use pin to do the parameter identification that you do okay. with the standard population balance model? Yes, at the model, we, that is, this is why we try to apply um, um, param parametric training for the neural networks to be able to um, train the neural network for a broad range of kinetic parameters. And then we could assign that solution with that, that is generated with the kinetic parameters, similarly that for that mirror model that you uh, published recently. So in that case, in a, in a parametrically trained neural network with a broad range of kinetic parameters as well, it would be possible to assign that kinetic parameter set that can best fit that um, experimental case. So in this way, it could be uh, useful. And this is what we're trying to uh, accomplish in the following months or weeks. OK, thank you. So Anna and Akim, would, you, would it be OK for you to switch on your camera again and um, have some Panel have some panel discussion. Um, so, um, so there are still um, a couple of questions that were left uh, for Anna. I think Anna answered them um, offline, and there's still a couple of I still see a couple of questions for um, Almos. Uh, maybe you can also uh, answer them by um, uh, writing the answer on the question and answer box. I have a question that maybe the three of you can try to uh, answer, a very simple and practical question. Um, so the question is the following. We are not data scientists, right? We are crystallization engineers. Uh, of course, we learn on the way all the tools that uh, we need to learn and master for our daily job. But, but this is not easy, right? I mean, we are talking about uh, something that requires knowledge that typically we don't have. I don't know about your personal um, education, but for example, in our institution, uh, we train chemical engineers, even you know, with a strong background in crystallization, with very little knowledge of statistics and data science. So what was, and this is the question, the most difficult thing for you to do in order to get the results that you got and presented in this presentation? What was the most challenging thing, the thing that you really didn't know and you had to learn from scratches? Was it uh, 
understanding what was the tool that you needed? Was it the programming in Python? Was it uh, choosing the right library? Was it uh, installing everything into your uh, desktop? Um, you know, what took you the most uh, time? Um, maybe we can start with uh, Akim. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think um, a bit of everything that you just mentioned, I would say in my case, um, for example, I'll say um, importantly is actually the domain knowledge of crystallization itself. Because, I mean, with the development of AI and machine learning, I will say selecting the right architecture or network to train a model isn't as daunting a task as actually understanding the problem that you want to solve. For example, I take uh, crystallization. Um, I think Anna mentioned at the beginning of our talk about um, agglomerations and shape and morphologies. So you, you take an image, um, you could infer a lot of things from the image. So if you're not a crystallization expert, you see bubble or droplets, you're trying to understand which is which. So I, I, I guess for me, that's the key, the domain knowledge itself. I mean, data science um, to a chemical engineer, it's more like an add-on. Like, uh, and I think the curriculum these days are trying to infuse a bit of um, um, AI and machine learning as as a playground for chemical engineers. So for me, it's the domain knowledge to understand what I actually want to solve. And then we can then start playing around with different algorithm training. Um, I mean, I have a background in coding and um, computational um, um, fluid dynamics and the rest. So coding wasn't an issue. But then certainly the crystallization and understanding the different dynamics that you're dealing with when you, when you have polymorphic changes or shape or habits that you've not seen before, how to distinguish between a needle, a plate, a 3D image of uh, maybe when there's a, when you when you see nucleation openings, how you distinguish that between maybe there's a, there's an antisolvent um, crystallization. So because in, a, in an industrial case like in in APC for example. We don't have the luxury of um, looking at image with one or two or three crystals in it. You have a very highly dense slurry system with thousands or hundreds of instances of either droplets of or, or crystal shapes. So that to me was um, a key learning curve, and I was blessed to work with a very capable uh, team in APC of uh, crystallization experts, and that actually made the learning curve for me a bit um, easier. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. Anna, what about you? What was the most challenging part for you? Um, I think the most challenging part wasn't um, like the coding or the basics of machine learning itself, because I already did both of that previously. But I think what was really difficult was kind of selecting what do we want the model to be able to extrapolate to or interpolate and then based on that what do we choose as a test set or validation set so these questions kept coming up for example um, so if we include other shapes in the training and test set then does that prove that it also works for other other shapes or um things like that and uh, yeah. another thing and, and sorry if i interrupt you you mentioned that yeah. uh, you did some uh, studying by yourself of these topics was it uh, for for a course a structured course that you took as a master or phd student or was it uh, learning by yourself uh, you know through um, online courses and webinars and conferences and summer schools um, a bit of both. So coding without machine learning, I've been doing since high school. Um, and then, so machine learning specifically, I worked a bit on it on my master thesis. And I also took a course at ETH, Introduction to Machine Learning from the Computer Science Department. And that's where I learned that. Okay, yeah. And okay. Um... I interrupted you. Um, did, are you finished with what you were about to say? Um, I, I I think or wait. <laughs> Sorry. Well, why, yeah, I guess uh, it just yeah, selecting yeah. a validation set that proves yeah. what, that it extrapolates to the things that we wanted to extrapolate to, and that's also why we did all the experimental validation. Mm -hmm. um, Almos, for you, 
um, what was the most challenging part? For me, the most challenging part was to learn the programming of the of the uh, algorithms, because I had the chance to attend many machine learning courses in my university studies, but they did not uh, teach me to how to program these in, uh, in real life. I knew all the ideas to in like generalization and testing and, and test studies and separating data, but not how to actually code this in my own. And then that that was that was something uh, challenging, but but. I think in the in, in nowadays with the help of Google and YouTube, I think many things can be learned. Yeah. So maybe um, one 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 last question, um, which uh, which which again applies, um, I guess, to all of you. Um, could you clarify a bit uh, the data requirements? Uh, this is a question that Ashwin has been asking to. Um, Almos specifically, but I think it applies to all of you. Um, so could you elaborate a bit more in terms of the data requirements? Yeah, and maybe we can start. Yeah, we can start. Uh, let's go with the with the same order as before. Akim, Anna, and then Almos. Yeah, for me, um, a very quick one would be importantly well, for any com uh, co um, any computer vision application. It's annotating or labeling the images. Um, and I think that's one of the most challenging tasks. Um, prior to now, you will do a lot of your annotation manually. So, but now with the with the with the advent of things like um, segment editing model from Facebook and then some uh, zero shot techniques, we actually did do do that pretty much faster now because an important aspect of this ML is usually data, 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 data. If the data is good enough, then the use case or the generalization becomes good. And I think that's my experience to date. Sorry, I was muted. Anna, <laughs> what, uh, what, what would be your answer for, for the question? So what were the data requirements for our so yes. yeah, in our case, the labeling wasn't so much of an issue because we just use simulated data. So we kind of know the ground truth from there. Um, I guess it's kind of the same answer from before, just selecting, sampling kind of the right morphologies, sampling the right lengths that actually represent what we would see in practice, I think. Yeah, thank you. Almosh? Yes, I was just typing the original uh, answer that uh, in these cases, when, when the, the underlying differential equation of the system contains not only temporal, but space-related equations as well, it is possible to only uh, uh, assign the initial and boundary conditions, and that can also constrain the, the domain of solutions so that the optimization algorithms can con converge. In my case, in this situation where the system order and differential equations in the moment equations do not contain any not temporal equations. We had to incorporate sample data, um, and that's why it was uh, incorporated. But in, in theory and in other uh, physics related equations, when there is like dx dt uh, equations as well, then uh, it is uh, possible also to, to gather only the physics uh, related equations, and there are no samples required at all. That's why we would like to apply this framework for to maybe solve a full PBM that has also not only time related data as well. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, um, it is 1158. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm um, turning it over to Martin um, and, uh, and, and uh, Bolo. Um, should we wrap it up and, and close it? Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Daniela, uh, uh, for hosting this very interesting uh, webinar. And uh, thank you to, uh, to all the speakers. Uh, I think this uh, shows a gr great innovation uh, in terms of uh, machine learning. And uh, I certainly learned a lot today. Um, I guess also most of the, uh, of the listeners uh, so the next uh, Spotlight uh, talks are upcoming and you can still register if you want uh, for now. Bye-bye. Um, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.